familiar. Sloan Stevens poking up with the coach. Kamal Murray, one of my favorite moments after any Grand Slam is when the coach and the player gets together, not to mention starting the XS Tennis and Education Foundation nonprofit organization in Chicago, helping to grow the game and field the next generation of stars, not to mention a great mean mug as well at the camera. We've got Kamal Murray here. So excited to have him as part of our Tennis Channel team for the next 10 days. No Eagle and Chandra Rubin as well. Uh, Kamal, thanks so much for joining us here on TC. We appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be here. How was it? First day? First <laughs> yeah. match? It was a pretty good one, you right? You know what I think? Whenever you're out of your element, you have to respect the art form. So I'm, I know this is, <laughs> this is an art form I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, so... A lot of respect. A lot. Of, I'm, I'm being coached right now. I will I, say, by the way, Janda, he looks good. He came in. He came in very fashionable. I do appreciate it. Oh, very I had clean. help. Don't worry. Okay, I, good. I, I okay, help. good. <laughs> I love it. No, it's 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 been it's been interesting, and, and we saw those pictures uh, come out of Sloan and, and winning the U.S. Open, and you know some of the results she's had since then. I'm curious when you look at what it took to get to that point. You know, what were some of the most important things for you that you were able to convey to her and, and to get to that moment where she's holding up the trophy? You know, I think when you're, when you're doing it for the first time, it's easier to get lost in the process because you don't know what's on the other side of the bridge after you cross it. But I think it gets harder the second and third time because you know, you understand now what it means to win a Grand Slam. So for the first time, you're just really so, you know, laser focused in. You get into a routine. You eat the same thing every day for 14 days straight. You have practice you know, at the same time every day. You get really superstitious, so you kind of lock in on superstitions. And then the second and third time, you try not to mess it up, right? And then I think it becomes harder because you understand what's at stake. You understand the history uh, versus just being locked into the, the superstitions and the routines. Well, I'm curious because we look at this year, and there have been so many things that had to be different, you know, that players have had to adjust to, obviously being off the tour for months at a time, but still trying to, as you say, kind of lock into what has worked and into your routines. How did you manage that, and, and how has 2020 been for the two of you? Yeah, I mean, quite honestly, I think we could have did a much better job of managing it. I think that um, sometimes being so involved in the process and in the decisions on, on all the calls and listening to every email, it can sort of take you out of just focus on being ready. You know, we knew that it would start at some point, but I think, you know, both of us were too much in the know and guessing on is it going to happen, is it not going to happen, is, it, is the tournament going to happen. I think that, you know, if we had to do it all over again, we would probably lock back into our process and kind of quiet some of the noise and just say, hey, but they're going to figure it out and we're going to be ready to play. Um, so, you know, I think one of the great things about tennis and coaching and players is that if you, you look at the year behind you, you be honest with yourself on some things you could have done better uh, so that we can move forward in a better position uh, for 2021. Well, look, Coco Goff burst onto the scene last year, Wimbledon 2019 in particular. We just talked a little bit about Coco and her disappointing result today. But how have you seen her game develop really in the last 15 months and certainly with the shutdown this year? How do you think that's been difficult for a 16-year-old? Well, I think it shows how quickly tennis changes. I mean, I, I joke with Sloan, uh, when she won the U.S. Open, Coco was playing juniors. And when she got to the finals of the French Open 2018, Coco was winning the junior French Open. And now she is a staple on the tour, getting in all the main draws. And so it really is amazing on how, you know, quickly she ascended to the top, but it's not surprising. You see a lot of young players sort of making the jump and, you know, really challenging the, 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 the older players and the more mature players to reinvent themselves and to continue to improve. So so it's been exciting to watch. I mean, I know her, I know her, her and her father personally, uh, and we hang out at the bar at night and go to dinner. So um, it's been exciting to just be a fly on the wall and sort of watch them go through this for the first time. Because, uh, you know, I was there in 2016, 2017, and, um, you know, I think it's great for the game. And I think this year, you know, last year was an adjustment for her, but I think in 2020 was in another immediate adjustment because last year you had Coco Mania. You had the crowd, you had, you had 19,000 people and Coco playing against the opponent. And now she sort of had to play by herself and get used to quietness and, you know, calm. And I think that's sort of a, a new, you know, environment for her and all the players. Um, but her in particular, because she did get so much fanfare at Wimbledon U.S. Open. She was walking out there used to being like her plus her army. <laughs> right. playing her opponent. Now it's just kind of her, right? And so I think it was, again, just a two years of constant change for her. So, you know, I empathize with her being 16, being thrown into this. Well, speaking of you and Corey, and we'll get to those bar stories in like Tennis Channel After Dark, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I know that we keep saying it's Kamau's debut on Tennis Channel. That's not entirely 
entirely correct. Let's go back to Melbourne of this year, January of this year. A little barbershop action. This was awesome. Yeah, it was fun. It's, it's, it's fun to get the guys together. I mean, a lot of these tournaments, you spend, you know, six, seven, eight weeks consistently uh, on the road. And, um, you know, you, you got to start to develop a sense of family and, a, you know, camaraderie amongst the players to sort of break up the monotony. And so this was just, you know, something we did that was pretty fun uh, to get the guys together. Now, I'm curious, Kamal, you know, was were there any people who were mad because they weren't included in this? I mean, this <laughs> looks like a pretty good group right here. T tons of people. I think <laughs> version two will be much different and might be a lot bigger. You know, we planned on it being a lot bigger, but now with social distancing, we can. But yeah, I think it uh, it was a good thing. A lot of people felt left out. So don't worry, we're coming for you. Well, I think Francis Tiapo was ready to suit up for the Dallas Mavericks. He had his full Luka Doncic attire ready to go, shorts and everything. So we'll have to ask him about that next time. Kamau is sticking with us the rest of the way here on TC Live. Coming up. We celebrate one of the most rare accomplishments in tennis history, certainly in the 2000s, when we return on Tennis Channel Live.